Wired. Unplugged. Hello, yeah. everybody. Welcome. This, uh, this episode apparently <laughs> is coming directly from the sun. It feels like it. It certainly does yeah. feel like it. Aaron, it's so good to have you back. It's been ages since we've been in the podcast together. It's been a while. Together. It's been I a while. We've, been, we've been flipping back and forth. And, yeah. And, and we are the podcast. We're so the fact that it's us. Uh, I am the Senate. Again. You know it, Exactly. Well, look, yeah. man, it's good to have you back. We had Gary on uh, last week. He brought a hat. You know, that's the thing. Like, people had to bring, like, props to kind of, like, substitute you you know what i mean that you just you look so natural to you gary couldn't do it without the aid of props he did a great job by the way and i oh wish you were there for some of the conversations um but you weren't the good news is you're here now so <clears throat> episode 22 we've got a jam-packed one um i spoke to pope art in this week's interview segment uh, formerly the Xbox put, but he's now branded out. The liturgy never stops. You know what I mean? Uh, like there's clergymen of <laughs> all sorts. So, so Pope is now just Pope, and he's uh, he's he does PlayStation and Switch and, and Oculus and stuff. And uh, I've seen this guy around. You've seen this guy around, right? On Twitter. Yeah, yeah, things. yeah. I've mm. I've I've seen him on Twitter. I've got to work with him in the past as well. Great, exactly. Um, so yeah. He's he. Uh, what I didn't know is he's a nice guy, and he also likes to talk like me. So it was a, it was it's a, like an hour long interview segment, but it was it's really good. And you know what? Actually, quite profound stuff in there. He talks about some really interesting things about the creative process. It says a lot of stuff that I was really interested to hear about, specifically about how long it takes him to do designs and things like that, and the limits he sets on himself. So keep an eye out for that in just a bit. It's like almost feature length. Interview. Yeah, which 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 actually what we should say is that that's why these these parts that we do are gonna be a bit shorter this week. Yes. 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 Because the word of the Pope is uh Exactly all is, is all holy and divine and who are we? <laughs> Just mere worms. So we've got a uh, a good amount of propaganda with the real, the undeniable minister of propaganda is back in, in the building. So I'm gonna run a rhythm. Um you're gonna show everybody what they've been missing whilst we've not been together. Okay. <laughs> Propaganda. For the audio listeners, Aaron left the camera shot, and I didn't know if he was coming back for a second there. Um, no, I'm here. I'm here. I thought, um, just given what Gary and Steve have done in the past, I thought I should show up. So uh, all right, I just okay. had to grab a little something. <laughs> and, all right, okay, go on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah. And now that. Right. Okay. How do I again? I'm. I'm like. All, I also. I'm like the closed captions guy. For the audio listeners, Aaron returns to the um, the canvas wearing a unicorn. A unicorn. I don't know what the word for this thing is. It's like a hat with gloves attached to it. What is it called, man? Like, what do you call these things? I don't know. Um, a headdress. <laughs> you know. I just wore it over there, and I was like, I'm gonna grab that. Hell yeah! It, lo it looks good, and I can't believe you're doing that because it's so hot. So ah, it's so hot. Truly good. So hot. You are a unicorn, one of a kind. The real Minister of Propaganda is here. And like honestly, like last week, there was loads to get through. Um to the point where I'm like, how much propaganda's in the tank this time? So why don't you let me and the people at home know what's going on? Yeah, so for the most part, a lot of the propaganda is gonna be about RK Paradise, which is coming up. It is so close to launch now. Mm -hmm. Talking a couple of weeks. Um, but but what Wired have been doing for the last couple of weeks is for their friends, for those that get into their RK Paradise Discord server, is offering out exclusive early closed beta access to the game. So you get to roam around, start building your arcade, start playing some of the games and getting a little taster. But it's happening again this weekend. It's happening again this weekend, Jake. People can get into the arcade I'm out really of the happy. heat. I'm really happy. It's got aircon. Well, I'd like, to I'd like to think that last last week, we had this kind of call out as well. Um, mm. But the podcast goes out on a Friday. And I, I was thinking to myself, oh, no, what if someone listens to this on a Monday? God forbid. Um. Turns out, Pope forbid. Turns out <laughs> that they probably signed up now. And it's good because, yeah, the, the fact that it's in Discord, you can get cool stuff. And there's another weekend of it. So close. It's a nice time to do a Peter, I think, too, because people are going to be like, oh, I want more of that. And then they don't have to wait long, do they? No, 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 no. 11th. August. It's really it's soon. It's really creeping up on, on everybody. Time is 
just a concept. So, yeah, if you want to, if you if you do want to get involved, get on over to the um, Arcade Paradise Discord server. <coughs> Sorry, I had a little cough there. <coughs> it's exci- some fluff- it is exciting. It is exciting. No, it was. Uh, it is exciting, but some unicorn fur thing yeah. went into my mouth. It's hair. Isn't uh, it? Unicorns have hair, not fur. Unicorn, yeah. unicorn hair went yeah. into my mouth, um, and it's magical. Made me cough. I wasn't yeah. ready for the magic, but get on over to the Discord server. And you can yeah. be in with a chance of getting involved in the uh, close beta ahead of launch. Brilliant. And obviously, like even if you're listening to this rather than watching it, which if you're not watching it, it's on YouTube, by the way, uh, you are uh, probably going to see the link in the description of either the podcast episode in Spotify and iTunes, etc., or in YouTube too. So just join it. And obviously, like it's good to join things like Discords because as the game launches and, and that whole run up, there'll be like an open, nice conversation. So it's not just just for this exact purpose, right? Uh, ex- exactly. You can yeah. talk with like-minded friends. I mean, the really good thing is it's filled with people who absolutely loved the old school arcades this, as well. This and is sharing stories it. and games. Yeah. And, hey, did you play this version of this? And even pinball game, uh, even pinball yep. table talk as well. Yeah, that, that's exactly, this is exactly the type of game, I think, that suits like this type of thing because it's got so many people who want to reminisce right mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. perfect so that that's a really nice thing first part of propaganda done old testament what's next part two part two oh uh moving ahead in time yeah we've mentioned this before um about the arcade paradise dev diaries we've had dev diaries with martha and so on as well and and these things are made to give you a proper inside look at development talk to the devs learn a bit what makes them tick learn a bit about the technology that goes into the game and the mumbo jumbo to make things happen um, and we recently have Dre on the show as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but more dev diaries are starting to roll out now, and I can't, I can't express how how much people need to go and have a look at these. I mean, these are people talking about you know they've spent years and years making this game, and they are pouring all their passion out for everyone to kind of get an understanding of why they've done this, but also how as well. Um, you know, Dre, you know, he he, he tells a story. <clears throat> About his 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 love of the arcades growing up, and you know what eventually led him going into game development, and what he's taken from his time as a youth, and you know to make a game that explores all of those childhood memories that are quite personal to him and the team as well. Um, there's there's more below the surface than you might think, so I do encourage everyone to go and have a little butchers, have a little butchers, insert a coin, sit back, very nice. relax. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie. Sorry to interrupt. It's getting quite hot in this unicorn hat. You can take it off now, but um, <laughs> soon. Yeah. Soon. Okay. What? One more. I was just gonna say that the last one, the last episode of the Dead Diary was like a few hours ago. It was the day that we're recording, not the day that this goes live, dear listener slash viewer. Uh, and uh, yeah, it had an, a lovely little appearance from a certain Gerald uh, who appears. <laughs> it, 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 it's it's quite. It's, they're they're really well done these Dead Diaries because I I like the the backdrops and stuff like this, and it's got a really nice aesthetic that that meshes with it. And uh, the appearance of uh, Gerald of the Riviera, uh, or on the Riviera, should I say? Uh, well, it was it was quite funny how it happens. So uh, yeah, I would recommend. All right, uh, one final bit of propaganda before your head melts. Yeah, if your so... head did melt though, that unicorn horn would look like a waffle cone, and you'd look like a little ice cream man. It but, would, but gross, like Lloyd Kaufman version of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, if you're listening, don't listen to him. You're beautiful, man. Um... <laughs> No, but the, the last piece of news is uh, the last piece of news, uh, should I say? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, is, yes. So I wasn't here last week. Uh, it's yeah. simply because I was in Pisa um, for yeah. an event called First Playable, which was incredible. Uh, Leo from White there. as well. Yeah. Mr. Z was over. Um, and, and the event is kind of like a gathering of minds from the Italian game industry. People from all over the world go over to um, share knowledge as well. So there are several panels that are run where. People talk about some secrets, some things that help, uh, even topics such as like diversity, inclusivity, and accessibility in video games, and why people should care as well. Um, not just in terms of for those that are playing, but for those that are developing as well, and and what having a more inclusive, diverse team can bring, and so on. But Leo was over there, who was meeting some uh, interesting uh, developers um, mm. who who had some amazing games. You know, we got to catch up with. Um, with the team from Storm in a Teacup as well, who who made Close to the Sun, mm-hmm. um, and just had a chat because you know they're Italian, they're in Italy, had a nice catch up. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the the one thing that I wanted to to raise about Pisa is there was a very interesting topic that came up, 
which was what does it mean to be a part of the games industry? Um, not necessarily just <clears throat> because I, I, I guess the way I want to phrase it is games are a global worldwide commodity for the most part, right? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> However, um, the industry doesn't grow in the same way that games are consumed and thrown out into the world. Right. And there was a really good um, core to this was how can everyone, no matter where they are in the world, contribute to fueling and growing the industry? It was a very interesting talk, which had uh, several members of the EGDF, which I think is the Europe European Game Development Fund, maybe don't oh. quote me. I thought, uh, I thought I'd beaten from... them on Command and Conquer, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Nod wins. Um, <laughs> but, uh, man, I want to play Cassian Cena. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it, essentially there were, there were people from uh, France, Croatia, and uh, Poland as well. So Poland, you know, the, the, the home of the Witcher games and so on. And they were comparing where they are in terms of the wider scope of the industry. Um, and there was a, an individual from Croatia saying, hey, you know, we're trying to get up to speed, but we're 10 years behind everyone else. But what does that mean? It's not necessarily that no hit games are being made there by developers, but mm. what is happening in the industry there, you know, within education, how are they fueling the creativity? Um, how do they get the government on board to support these initiatives and so on? Um, and then, you know, it was it was the case, you know, that they it was mentioned CD Projekt, you know, they put out The Witcher, massive wow. selling game. Um, <clears throat> I've Witcher heard of that. Yeah, 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 you've definitely heard yeah. of it. <clears throat> um, but uh, I, I think the interesting thing to me was, you know, one very globally successful game mm. uh, from a capable developer does not make the industry grow. Um, Intr yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, and, and that was just something that I, I've been mulling over in terms of, you know, how, how can people contribute? How can people share more? And how actually does the industry grow as a whole? Um, because, you know, as we said, games are consumed globally, no matter where they are made, but the industry doesn't grow in proportion. Um, so there are people in these areas that are making incredible experiences, but they're not able to reap the same benefits as mm. other territories elsewhere in terms of health of game development in tax credits and things like that, um, wow. education and so on. Yeah. So <clears throat> it was just a general musing that I took away that I found quite interesting. So I thought I'd, I'd bring this and share. No, very good. Yeah, honestly, mm. that, so that sounded like a you know decent. I was like kind of worried about you for a second. I was like, if he carries on, that head's gonna melt. But <laughs> you've made it. Um, so you know, it's quite an insightful time, and I hope for the people who have been listening to the podcasts, um, you know, week on week, especially when we bring in the developers to talk, you'll kind of learn that when we do speak to them, a lot of them are quite forthcoming with how they met Wired, and a lot of the stories involve meeting them at events like this one. So, yeah, in case, you know, you're somebody who didn't know much about the games industry before listening to this, this is kind of one of the many things that happens there. Also, probably yeah. lots of pasta. So, very, very good. Um, again, coming up soon, we have the man himself. Um, Pope Art adorns us with his uh, glorious divinity um, in a 58 minute long interview segment in, in just <clears> a <throat> moment. So I guess before that, we will cast our net outside of, of Wired Headquarters and see what's happening on the World Wide Web. I always say cast our net. I should say cast our web because it's World Wide Web. Anyway, let's go. No stole from Google. Love that one. That might be my favorite one of all of them. I like it. Yeah. Um, just hits, just you shouldn't pick bangs. favorite jingles, but you know, it's 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 classless of me, but I think that I like yeah. that one the most. Well, the world has kept turning, uh, despite the heat, and lots of stuff's happened. What have we got on, Aaron, this week? Well, <clears throat> we did just have on a unicorn hat. And if you're watching the video version, my face has turned very red, and I am in fact probably gonna die um but <clears throat> in terms of news <laughs> news that we stole from the internet so first up very interesting very um a shame a shame really um and that is that bandai namco have confirmed that they have indeed been hacked uh they were targeted by <clears throat> a hacker group uh that made some suggestive threats that this was going to happen but it has been confirmed that that indeed uh did happen and did take place so at the moment they're assessing what exactly to to what extent um 
they have had information taken from them um, in terms of company secrets, you know, unpublished, unannounced games and so on. Um, but also there was uh, a potential that some customer consumer data may have been taken along with that, mainly from the Japanese side, apparently, I, I, I believe, mm. allegedly. Um, <clears throat> but I, ju I just wanted to bring up that that had happened. And it's a shame. It's a shame, really um that yeah. you know i i don't really understand the, the the purpose and reasoning behind why someone can would do this just because of saying i can well um, there's a i mean this one's a little bit deeper than the rest because it's ransomware so it's uh for those that don't know ransomware <clears throat> is like when um like a target like gets basically extorted for money by a hacking group who basically steal sensitive data take all of their data before they let anyone know they've even been in there and then they send a message saying we have just taken all of your files and if you don't give us money as well as damages your information will be sold at auction on the black market so this actually happened to capcom yeah uh, they were victim of a ransomware attack by ragnar locker and they got destroyed everything leaked even things that people kind of collectively agreed to forget about like resident evil 4 remake mm -hmm. that we saw this year that was announced two years ago yeah yeah which 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 is why <laughs> which is so, so weird that when it came to the announcement it's like why am i excited why do i feel like i already knew about this and it was because of that <laughs> yeah it was like, okay. exactly and and oh yeah. I, I i was gonna say there's another one i didn't want to say but i remember that's been officially announced recently dragon's dogma 2 was the other one that, that, that oh. was mentioned there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, I think there's one more, I won't say it, that's just it's on the way. And I was like, hmm, I think the Street Fighter logo, that really bad one, also yeah. leaked, you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> so, um, you know. There was also the NVIDIA leak as well, right? Where, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it came out, it was unsubstantiated, it, it, yeah. unsubstantiated, no one could confirm what was real and so on. But then mysteriously, miraculously, over time, <laughs> those things loads of be, things have which, come to life so yeah, yeah. weird little fact i've got for you here the ransomware group here uh alpha but they used to be called black cat ransomware a lot of feline based uh black cat groups. black cat like a, oh, a, black a kitten cat. uh yeah. and actually the 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 group that hacked into cd project red the exact same thing happened to cd project red a year ago i think post mm. cyberpunk and got all the stuff stolen and the source code for for cyberpunk was was stolen by another hacking group who were also cat based and they were called hello kitty there you go <laughs> i seem to remember uh this and then i googled Cute it to name, sure. evil deeds evil yeah yeah <laughs> bad kitty bad kitty um, no. so yeah now we don't know what degree of information has been taken, but if it's anywhere near as bad as the NVIDIA leaks and the Capcom leaks, well, you know, what could be in there? Elden Ring DLC, Bloodborne 2, well, <laughs> you know, oh no, no, it's uh, it's probably more likely the really boring stuff to hear about if you're a consumer, but really, really damaging stuff. Now, remember, Bandai are obviously also a huge toy manufacturing company, mm -hmm. and so a lot of old school brick and mortar store relationships will have information leaks that I reckon that's what will be in a lot of damaging retail partner info, you know? Yeah. Um, so, wow. Okay. Um, speaking yeah. of um, leaked stuff, I didn't notice when you've said this, I had a cheeky Google and I am <laughs> like, this is like my most anticipated thing. So you tell, you tell everyone at home yeah, what it is I mean, that you found. Generally the theme of this section is theft, I guess. Um, <laughs> but, um, the secret yeah, so, ingredient is crime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, tasty crime. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, apparently again, it was uh, it was alleged that um, a version of Skate Four had leaked and made it online, um, and people were asking, "Is this true? Is this real? Huh? What's going on?" Um, but it, it's again, this now seems to have been confirmed by EA, who have outright ask people to you know if they are if they are fans don't download this build don't play it um you know mm. the version of the game is from uh september 2021 um yeah. so some time ago um <clears throat> and i think you know as well jake how much games can change in that space of time so i don't you know it's it it doesn't surprise me that saying don't play this this is not representative of the final thing you know, they've only really just come out of the gate recently and said, hey, here's an update video on 
what everything is looking like and so on and mm. you know everything is still being uh made and jigged and stuff and this was like a couple of weeks ago and the game looks great it looks great it looks great um <clears throat> so again it's a shame that this has leaked uh, a playable test build of the game has leaked um Yes. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I know you're excited. Are you well, I, it? No, I... no, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> downloading it right now. I was. I. I actually. I actually got a bit confused because I was looking and I saw that there was. Um, that there'd been some build of it that all that leaked in in April. In April. No. Really. Uh, yeah, but it's really like. Like oh. Like like, like blocked yeah. out. Like you can yeah, still yeah. see. It's like it's like it looks like it's running in Unity. Like you can still see arrows under the player, and the buildings are literally like. Graphics looks like Simpsons hit and run. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so like, yeah, and but, you know, we're lucky enough to work in the industry and we're not just saying it like the amount of changes that like, you know, like, let's just like take this back to like earlier in the podcast. We're talking about Arcade Paradise. There's the closed beta and things like that. That's mm -hmm. so developers can get a bit of time to improve things. And you'll probably be surprised if you play the closed beta and then you play the launch and the difference in just a few weeks and yeah. it's just little things like this and so yeah the amount of pre like pre-alpha by the way is the thing about that word is it's so damaging because these days with steam early access games come out in early access in alpha and beat you know so, so pre-alpha yeah. like that's in some cases that's playable i think valheim was playable in alpha uh kickstarters yeah. a lot of kickstarters say if you kickstart this you can have access to the pre-alpha so i think that uneducated like person might think that this just means like the demo, you know, because that yeah. sometimes can be the case. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm staying I'm staying away from it. No, completely. it's it, it, it is a shame when this happens because it denies it denies people the surprise. It denies people uh, to be presented the game uh, in the correct terms, and you yeah. rob people who've been working passionately for years. Yeah. Um, some of the, the shine to their work to be able to go, Hey, this is, I'm so proud of this. This is what I've been doing. I'm, yeah. you know, I, I think let's, let's talk about a game that you and I, I think both love and appreciate, um, Elden Ring. Yeah. Like yeah. before that yeah. came out, there was the, the leaked video, um, Exa exactly. the game being played and stuff. And I think yeah. everyone's like, Oh, that looks a bit rough. And it's like, of course it's an early build. It's like, that yeah, is not exactly. the final thing. Like, don't take it. It's, <sighs> That, that, you know that's very important to, to mention isn't it and then yeah mm. like you get things like actually one of the things of elden ring i remember is that the the, the they did a the game launch in feb in november so months and months and months before um they did a play test a closed network test it was very very exclusive people yeah, yeah, yeah. were jailbreaking their playstation so they could keep hold of the build they data mined the build and they found that nearly the entire dialogue of the main quest they pieced it together, just like with Internet Detective work, and basically the entire plot of the game was, was on, still was on... unfathomable. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, but it's it, it, been pieced yeah. together since before Christmas, I think. Wow. You know, um, and so some of it was wrong, but like when the game came out, it was kind of weird and like a bit of a bit of sweet moment, I'm sure, for people who read it. I actually stayed away from it, and then I checked out afterwards because the post is on Reddit. And I was like, oh my god, they really did it. So yeah, yeah. and it, it's just annoying. It, it dampens a lot. And a lot of people are excited for this. A lot of people are really excited um, for like a kind of casual sportsy game and stuff like that. So the ability to to take that away from the devs like so soon is 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 a shame. So yeah, that yeah. sucks. It's been a bit of a uh, sad news. I feel like this really is ultimate propaganda. You've kind of gone, here's what's going on at Wired. Everything's great. Here's what's going on elsewhere. <laughs> Everything sucks. Stay with us. It'll no, be okay. But, uh, but again, it's, I mean, it, it's just to, been bad. Yeah. To, to throw this back to, you know, here's what's going on at Wired. I think, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago as well, we mentioned that, hey, gory, uh, cuddly carnage. We took a build of that to PAX and let people play it. And since then, uh, we made the announcement, oh, actually, now um, the, the game is going to be on uh, Unreal Engine 5, and it's going to take advantage of, of what that has to offer. Exactly. And again, that is within a very short period of time how much a game can change based on those decisions. Gory, you know, is it's, it's still gory, but it, it has now also jumped a long way as well. Yeah. So it has it has evolved in a very short space of time, yeah, uh, and will continue to a lot launch, shorter but... than September twenty twenty one to now. Yeah, like I think exactly. we're still in lockdown then in the UK. Yeah. Right, so it's weird to think. Anyway, yeah, that's that's um, that's been a, that's been a, that's been a good a good stint. That now, everybody, I'd like to just <clears throat> ask you to get comfortable, 
Uh, make yourself a drink. Pause this and go and get yourself a drink. Because, like, this is a long one. I've got to tell you, though. First of all, I didn't know that Pope was like Geordie. I didn't know. I, th- I assumed yeah. he was American for some reason. Don't know why. Uh, I-, I remember the first time I had a call with him and I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Pope is going to share with you some pretty interesting stories. This guy, in case you don't know, um, is a bit of a Twitter phenomenon. Like, if you ever see any conversation about a game announcement, you just see this guy getting tagged in things all the time. Pope, do this. And he's every. 10 seconds later. He, he's Here like, bam. <laughs> yeah, this is a hardworking guy with a very interesting story. And uh, he's he's going to be joining me now to talk about that a little bit more. So um, it's the uh, the radiant light of Pope Art. Wired. Unplugged. Hello, everybody. Here we are in the interview segment. And today I am bathed in the radiant divine light of the Pope. Well, not just not 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 the religious boring one, the good art one. So hello, Pope. How are you doing? Hi. I'm I'm doing great. I mean, um <laughs> I don't often do many podcasts, but uh, when I do them, it's it's always a pleasure. It's it's the easiest thing in the world, right? Just having a conversation. Don't need to do anything big and extravagant. It's just a lovely convo. So listen, for the for the people who are at home watching and listening, uh, who might not know, uh, who are you and what do you do? Um, so most people just call us Poop. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, my brand name's Poop Art, mm-hmm. which obviously people call Pop tart or oh yeah, pop tart or um, I think the Americans sometimes struggle with my name. They, they kind of don't distinguish the pop and the art side of it, you know. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, but it was funny because obviously I am um, I am from the northeast, so I'm a you know a majority. If anybody knows what that means, um, so back in the day, my first name used to be like Jordy Tommy because obviously I'm called Tom, you know. Yeah. And um the again the Americans couldn't understand like how to say the word Geordie. <laughs> it's I I love the call so, yeah the Call of Duty 4 lobby days where like it was Americans and British people trying to say each other's usernames and they they yeah. struggle with not they? Yeah. Yeah exactly so I thought oh, I'm gonna have to change this. So then I changed Obviously, I became Xbox Pope, you know, and yeah. um, I did did many years, you know, is it, is it, him doing all the fan arts. Um, and if people don't understand, it, well, you can see all these kind of crazy controllers around my room. Yeah, um, I tend to pimp up controllers, you know, so there could be Xbox or PlayStation, or mm-hmm. I've started doing like Nintendo Switches and Steam Decks and. Um, Oculus Quest, um, and I kind of I don't. So I'll, I'll always tell people I don't do graphics. Like yeah. I'm not I'm not trained as a graphic artist. I'm actually trained as a interior designer. But um, ah, that's the, what I'm really good at because obviously I spent many years in in the sort of design industry, nearly thirty years. Yeah. Um, I used to I used to design for a lot of huge brands, you know, around the world. And it was kind of my job to help brands sell, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously I had more of a, a consumer level brand design. Right. Um, yeah. So the objective was is you almost have to tell stories or create theatre. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of kind of gets lodged in the, in the consumer's brain and then the kind of impulse buy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of used a bit of that. With the fan art, so what I what I'll normally tell people is I don't do graphics. I tell stories on controllers, mm-hmm. you know. So that's why a lot of them are quite sort of you know, crazy and out there and uh, and things like that, you know. But people love that, you know. I think it's it's different from the norm, I guess. Yeah, it is absolutely. And so um, I hope there are people out there listening who aren't aware of your story because as this conversation unfurls it goes places there's some really interesting places that this goes now i've been kind of aware of you for a while uh and i'll just go straight in with the anecdote i was one of the 
20 people in the world. <laughs> Sorry, that's so disrespectful. I was one of the 20 people in the world that believed in Mixer, okay? And so when, yeah. when when Mixer was going on, I really loved it. I loved what they were doing. And um, and during the, the whole the Mixer exodus, when it crumbled, I, I, was, I was watching all of them move over to Twitch or Facebook gaming. And loads of them, they... they they were literally worshipped you, which is the, the kind of Pope thing there. And so yeah. um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll go and tell the origin story in a little bit. But in fact, whilst we're on the subject, what do you remember about about Mixer? Did you have a relationship with any of the people using uh, it or anything like that? I mean, I, I was I was a, a day one Mixer, mm -hmm. sort of. Um, let's see. I don't know what the word is, you know. I kind of joined Mixer day one anyway. Not, not, as, a, not as a streamer, because I don't really show my work yeah um, not that i've got any secrets it's just i just don't get time to to kind of to, to stream that side of things and yeah. plus I, i'm kind of under so many you know restrictions to what right. i can and can't show mm -hmm. it's always difficult you know so um i really fell in love with mixer you know i, th I thought you know, why did it ever end? You know, why did it ever die? Because mm -hmm. this thing was just, it was just easy to use. It was easy to engage with, you know, the, the charts and um, the, the streamers. And and one thing I took from that, doing all the fan arts, because normally the fan arts are based on community requests, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like, oh, poor will you do this? Poor will you do that? You know, mm -hmm. but then I, I found what I quite enjoyed the most was taking a streamer and taking their brand or their identity and kind of creating a fan art for them, you know? Mm. And um, because if I, what I found in the past was if I had said, oh, this is an awesome streamer, you should check them out, you know, he or she, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, people would kind of go, yeah, okay. But if I did a fan art and I posted it, it just seemed to have that extra sort of draw you know, yeah. so yeah. people really did listen. People really did notice, and then they would go, you know, and and nine times out of ten, you know, these people would go, "Oh my God, Pope! Like I can't believe you did that!" You mm -hmm. know, like this is this is like amazing, you know, and um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, I seen you know at the back end of mix, I seen a lot. Of, a lot of the hurt that was happening right you know, people just were really panicking because they had built this huge sort of audience for themselves and then it was just taken away like from them like yeah. within a day or something you know it was it was just gone um yeah interesting so funny. yeah i was very much behind a lot of the the content creators and the you know the streamers yeah. to to try and lift their spirits back up try and get them you know Mm -hmm. um into places because hence that's what the pope stands for you know the what i tend to enjoy the most about my job is helping people yeah yeah right like and and, and obviously i don't i don't charge for that you know it's it's a service that shouldn't really be charged it's it's just being kind you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right and... um so yeah i mean it, it the more i became this poor character that the community give me that title i didn't you know think oh let's call this poor one day you know um the more i kind of thought well who else can i help you know um yeah. and it was through the fan arts that i started helping people so um there was people who i could see weren't very happy you know that had a, a bit of trauma going on maybe mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um just something not yeah. cool that day, you know? So I would do them a fan art, post it, and, you know, I would get messages back, like, you know, private messages saying, like, you know, oh, my God, this is the nicest thing anyone's ever done, you know? You've, yeah. you've really made my day feel special. And and that's where I, I kind of adopted the tagline where, it, you know, my job is just to put a smile on a face. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's it's yeah it's it was I I think that's how I first noticed you was around the just before Mixer crumbled and then I I think it, yeah it's because it did really well for you too in the sense that people love to share that I think a lot of streamers specifically. 
the only artists that they tend to work with or people who do any sort of art are emotes, which is the most strange 100 by 100 yeah. pixel thing. So to see something like an overlay on a console that they love is must be very legitimizing for them and, and very exciting. So um, on, yeah. on, that, on that, like consoles are obviously something people really love and Mixer has a very tight affiliation with Xbox. So let me just sort of take it back for you there you've shared already that you kind of come from a, a, a different background so to speak um you know interior design and, and working already on the consumer market you, you've already got a very good business head there you're not some like 19 year old who just dreamed i want to make xboxes one day so that's an interesting yeah. start for the story but what i do want to know is gaming for you when can you remember getting into sort of gaming like what was your first ever experience all the way back seeing like a console or an arcade machine and being like oh that's interesting yeah it was funny because obviously it was a it was a relative and he had um, an atari you know uh -huh. i think everyone started more or less on an atari especially my age <laughs> yeah right you know um uh -huh. and it, and obviously then i kind of I kind of gravitated towards a Spectrum ZX. Remember them with the rubber keys? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it would like it would take it would more or less. You, you could make a cup of tea and eat your dinner before the game had loaded. You know. Um, uh huh. So um, and this thing was cool, you know. And and obviously one of my favorite games on there was was kind of. Do you remember uh, Dizzy the Egg? You know, a little dizzy. I, I, it was like, actually, I someone else yeah. brought it up a few weeks ago, so I ended up looking it up, and it's like a really sort of. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> or kind of uh, school days or Manic Minor and things like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and and then, you know, the I kind of drifted more towards, because I had better graphics, you know, it was like the Commodore Amiga, so I never really sort of dabbled too much in consoles. Right. I, okay. maybe, I maybe had a Sega Saturn once, I think. I right. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. owning one of those, and... Um, but then I kind of went straight into, after that, I kind of went straight to the PC end. So I was more of a PC gamer. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so consoles were never really a, a huge thing. In fact, my first ever console was, was an Xbox. I was going to ask that, actually, because I was thinking maybe you grew up on something else. And then what made the jump to Xbox? Can you remember what it was like or what the games you got with it? What the first experience was with it to have a controller rather than a mouse and a keyboard and stuff? Yeah, it was, do you know, it was, it was, it was not long after, well, obviously I had my son and he was at the right. age where he could sort of play games, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I remember going into a game store and, um, it was always set up where one side was Xbox, one side was PlayStation, you know? Yeah. That's just, it was just how it was. And yeah. uh, so I just turned around to him and I said, which one, which side do you want to go? Which path? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and literally he went to Xbox. So we've kind of just stayed there ever since, you know? Um, and I think the first game we ever played was um, because at the time it was the 360 with, with the very first generation Connect. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think it was that. Remember that tiger game, you know, where you could interact with some tigers oh, or yeah, well, is it like Connectimals, something like that? Uh, like, something it's, it's, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because obviously he was only young, so I couldn't really like uh, put him on Dead him. Space, yeah, or Grand Theft Auto or something, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> yeah, um, so it was, uh, yeah, and then yeah, we used to just sort of. I remember me and him would go in and just sort of get little sort of cheesy games you know and and, and just sort of sit together and play them um nice. but i do you know if i was to go mix it up a little bit i think i did up where i live in newcastle near, near the mm -hmm. coast there's a, there used to be this place called the spanish city and um basically it was just a huge dome area full of arcade machines you know Wow. So you could literally go in there as a, as a young kid and just, you know, if you had some money, <laughs> or, or you could uh, you could beg for some money just to play a game, you know. Yeah, yeah. I I'm a I'm a coastal lad as well. I'm in North Wales in Rill, so I know the Spanish city Whitley Bay area, isn't it? Yeah, oh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So it's like um, arcades. It, hmm. 
you know, I mean, you would do anything to get a little bit of co- You remember their machines where the, the coins would just, uh, you have to push the, yeah. you know, give them a quick little nudge or something here and there just to yeah. drop a bit of cash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes people would leave cash in the bottom. So you could sometimes just go around and do a bit of mind sweeping. And find I exactly. Just used to do all that kind of thing as a, as a kid, just to, um, just to be able to play a game on an arcade, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you're always mesmerized as well as a, as a, as a young person, um, how cool the graphics were, you know? It's like, oh, look, oh, look at this, you know? Exactly, um, yeah. And it's and I think if you look at it nowadays, it's like they're almost photorealistic, you know? But like um, yeah. back then, you, like, you just didn't even notice like stuff like that, you know? You, yeah, you have to really have been uh, and acclimatized to it to understand it. Because I don't think anyone young would believe us if we said that looked real, trust me, Tomb Raider one was like photo real, and everyone was like, mm. "Yeah." So, all right, and so just for a nice little comparison, then, so we've gone from like Dizzy Egg School Day. Uh, you must be very, very busy, hard to find time to play all of the latest releases. But can you remember the last game that you had a, a spin off that you were really enjoying? Um. Well, I mean, I mean, if if there's one game or, or one franchise, I'm like. I'm like a total lover of it. It's got to be Titanfall, you know? Oh, I yeah. Mean, Respawn, like, yeah. Yeah, and then, so I've always stuck with that game, you know? Mm. And then, obviously, they brought out Titanfall 2, and I kind of was a little bit upset with them, you know? I was like, oh, what the hell? You know, it's like, it's one of those don't fix what's not broken, you know? But they, they did. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but the, to be fair, you... It's like anything, you know, change is difficult, but once you get used to it, it's yeah. fine, you know. Um, so, yeah, but my last game I ever played, because I'm, I'm also a big fan, is uh, the Sniper Elites. Yeah, uh, right, okay. So they, had, they brought out um, Sniper Elite 5 on Game Pass, you know, so yeah. I was like straight in there, you know. Um, yeah. It's, but I... because I uh, because I work so much for so many, you know, game companies and stuff like that um i just very rarely get time to game nowadays you know mm-hmm. yeah uh, I can imagine my kind of my kind of sons took over that spot <laughs> exactly yeah you ask him what's good and and he'll let you know right it's one of those he, he does all the hard work and finds the good games and then you can just play them right so oh, he plays all them uh simulators you know the flight sims oh does and, he yeah yeah yeah, yeah. there's yeah, loads of them euro truck and and all of that sort uh, of stuff. He yeah does the, he, he's got his own truck and things like that so um it's a, it's a different it's world great, now. You know? Yeah, yeah. Pe- people love that sort of stuff. It's always like on Steam or whatever. It's always the top, isn't it? Like you're a truck sim, flight sim, and I, yeah. I, it's a, I don't know. Like to me, it's just some. I don't know. I, I've tried. I tried Microsoft Flight Sim when it came out because I wanted to fly over my own house. That's about uh, it. That's, that's about it. It's funny. Uh, it's funny. It's the first thing I did is like, yeah. right, fly from Newcastle. Where we, where did we go last on holiday? Right, I'm gonna fly there. <laughs> yeah, do it. yeah, yeah. I've just got to remember. So, hey, the airport looks kind of not the same. <laughs> yeah, ex- that that was the thing yeah. I found. I live in like yeah North Wales, and I think they just gave up when they get, got there. They were just like, yeah, I just put some trees and mountains. But uh, no, it, it was decent. So okay, well, you just mentioned actually then that you work with quite a lot of companies, which is a nice opportunity again for the people who who don't already know. To, to sort of branch into that conversation and so um yeah you, you've kind of you know mentioned already in in good detail like it started off you know you were doing a service for free keeping people's spirits up really community driven people really really like that um people are always making requests to you even now probably whilst we're having this conversation there's probably some twitter mentions that you need to check out Do you know that um but can you remember the first like company publisher that came to you officially and said look let's make this a reality yeah i, I, I do and um it, it's funny because when you get your first kind of commission mm. you tend you tend not to forget about it yeah it's kind of it's kind of weird even though i you know, i probably have I have I have over twenty five partnerships, you know, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of a lot um, for one person. I mean, I'm kind of as an individual, I'm the only person that's actually Microsoft Fender approved, you know, which yeah. is like the hardest. 
which mm-hmm. is like the hardest thing a single person can achieve. Like mm-hmm. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Realize, right? I was talk so I was talking to my friend, and I can call him a friend because well, that's what we are, you know, the, the godfather himself, you know, shame is <laughs> blackly, you know. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Me and him kind of because he loves he loves the kind of the Geordie sort of area, you know. So um I was telling him and I said, oh, I've been like Microsoft vendor of like, what? How did you get that? You know, that's like the hot do you know that's the hardest thing anyone can achieve? And I was like, wow, that's cool. But anyway, my first commission was with Square Enix, you know. Uh-huh. And uh I started working with the guys at Square and I and I, I kind of fanboyed a little bit. I was like, oh my god, it's Square Enix, you know, like mm-hmm. what what the hell they're calling me for, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember and, what it was um, for? It was for the when they first started uh, doing Outriders. Yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously, I knew a lot about the game before it even you know got any attention, you know. Yeah. And um, so yeah, it was it was working with with, with those guys, and and honestly, super nice people. Like, like in fact, I worked with a lot of game developers, and and I kind of you, you just honestly, they're, they're such the they're, they're the nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. You know, it's like. You know, even if you're having a bad day, they'll 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 still kind of like be cool about this. <laughs> yeah, ex- ex- we were just talking about that before we started recording, actually, about about this because um, I'm curious to to know. And nearly every single person on the podcast has got a story about how they first met or spoke to or got in contact with Wired, and nearly all of them have got some sort of weird aspect to it, like cockroaches or. Uh, it sounds no, weird. For me, for me, it was yeah. Guy up there, deliver us to the moon. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of did a. I remember it was the. It wasn't the Series X. It was the the One X. Yeah. You know, and I did this kind of fan art. Generally, nine times out of ten, when I do the fan arts, that's what kind of draws in, you know, the the, the sort of publishers and the, and the developers, and they kind of go, "Oh my god!" Like. How can we make that real, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got to know the guys at Wired and and to be fair, I've always loved Wired, you know, the the the, the type of the, the type of people who and you know, I, I like to support a lot of indie developers, you know. I think indie indie games is is kind of super special to me because I love the story behind it. The fact that it's some guy in his bedroom, you know, and yeah. he's kind of created this game. And it's like, what, you created that? Like, how amazing is this game, you know? Uh-huh. And I think the guys at Wired also see that kind of, like, they see that talent within it. Mm-hmm. And they kind of, like, support them and take them on and, and kind of and help, you know, run this thing out, you know? And, and I love that kind of part about Wired that, that that's what they do you know it's they're not a, a company that well i've got time for you you know they, they're just the take you and the the care for the care about it and the the take you on the journey with them you know yeah um, but, but that's that's nice to hear uh that it's a like a mutual love for supporting indie developers bedroom developers right we uh we've had i've had i've been lucky enough to interview quite a lot of the wired uh roster the stable of developers and uh kyokun who do deliver us moon what joined me for a couple of episodes don't know yeah. if you ever got to speak to those guys they're like these massive yeah, hench, yeah, yeah. hench lads with like spacesuits on all the time and they're just like laughing about everything and talking about telescopes it's mad but uh... yeah, because obviously when i did the console yeah because uh, uh, generally when I do the the giveaways or the stuff, even like the clap chop one there, that yeah. like that that one's the only one in the world, you know. And I think it was the very first custom Series X to, wow. to actually be done. Yeah. Um, I don't like. I'm not interested in big numbers. Yeah. I'm I'm more happy just doing one or two or three, and keeping them keeping them like really exclusive. Yeah. So you know, when I did the stuff for the guys that deliver us to the moon, it was it it, it was great because I, I think I was in one of their streams once and they were like, Oh my god, there's poop, you know. It was like <laughs> Yeah, very, very cool. Um, yeah. um it I always get uh, surprised at the amount of people who I'm I'm just gonna say the word fanboy, you know. It's yeah. like yeah. when when you actually get to speak to poop, you know, it's like 
Oh my god, it's Pope. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's good that like you're quite a recognized name and stuff like that. And like, yeah, I, I think I think there's this kind of nice understanding on the internet more than ever that like people who work in the arts are like yeah. I think what it is with content creators specifically or streamers is that everyone can have a crack at it and stuff like that. But people seem to have a lot more respect for people who do art, especially streamers. They know the, the importance of it because one of the first things you learn, I guess, when you're streaming is the importance of an overlay, just like even just placement of things. So like yeah. with, with your design, like the ability to like, well, I don't know, you're using a very weird canvas, aren't you? A controller isn't a normal canvas. There's lots of blocks and blotches out the way and stuff like that. So yeah, and then you've also got to watch out for distortion because obviously the, you know, you've, you've got a sort of smooth curved area. Then you've got like a really, you know, yeah. So it's 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 weird because people just think ah, oh, you just slap a graphic on, you know, and, and that's it, job done. But it it's not as simple as that, you know, because you have to kind of be careful of you know distortion or where you would put text if you do put text on or. If you're putting a character image on, you know, yeah. is the D, is the D part or the thumbstick gonna like cut his eye out or something? You know, it's 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 um, and, and I think I've kind of nailed that side of things. I still see other people who do control our art, and it's like, like why why did you do that? You know, like <laughs> why did you not just move it a little bit more to the left or the right or yeah. Like give it a twist. It's it's almost like um, they're scared to to offend the the graphic, you know. And it's like, yeah. but that's what art's about. And I always tell people there is no right or wrong answer to yeah. what we do. It's just whatever you feel like creating, you know. But I think it's also important for people like me with like thirty years experience to also not tell them what to do, but just to guide them and and educate them where. Yeah. The next time they do something, it'll look even better, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. That sort of mentorship kind of um, is, I think, the you know the, the 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 mentor and protege relationship is like one of the oldest like relationships ever, and I think it's super important for people to learn from people who have done it before. So, I mean, uh, one of the things I wanted to know, just like completely layman's terms, I suppose, like I, I'm assuming that you don't just open up a blank Photoshop like template or whatever and get to work what's the kind of standard like you don't have to get too granular but like let's say like mm -hmm. somebody let's say tomorrow somebody commissioned you to do something what's your thought process do you have to go and lie on a sofa like don draper to get creative for like an hour how does yeah. like how's it work well because obviously i have um you know i'm uh i'm, I'm kind of mm. i wouldn't say i wouldn't disable is not the right word you know but obviously i have dyslexia and, and, and things like that mm -hmm. so like my my head overthinks. Yeah. Like so, you you might have one idea. By that time you've had one, I've had ten. Yeah. By that time you've had ten, I've had a hundred. Yeah. So my head works in a three dimensional space. So I'm constantly right. If I do that, and and it's so I've already kind of got a plan what it is I'm going to do. You know, and yeah. and what I also my a little bit of a secret, I guess, is everything that you see within the fan art anyway, especially, it's all done within 10 to 30 minutes. Yeah. Like, it, like I can't go past 30 minutes. Um, it, it's not because, obviously, I haven't got time. It, it's the fact. After 30 minutes, you start thinking, like overthinking. Right, okay. So then you'll kind of, like, move things. and you're, oh, Just I'll for the sake the of it, sort of thing. Or I'll, yeah. like, you know... Um, and, and the idea about the fan arts is they're meant to be organic. So when I'm working with a client, I'll also treat them as fan art. So I'll also, you know, just bash loads of ideas. Yeah. On a, on an actual three D model. Mm -hmm. So I don't use, you know, I use Photoshop to create the texture, but then I I wrap it on a three D structure, um, which obviously then I render out and. You, you know, you might do a bit of post production afterwards, um, and then if the, you know, if it, if the clients approved it and they're happy, then I'll take that into a more refined process. You know, like using vector forms and yeah. Um, okay. Sometimes I'll I'll you know um, I'll three D sculpt parts 
you know, or our 3D model parts, but then you render kind of like top view down, you know, so you, oh, you right. still get that, you still get them sort of areas. Um, it, it was always funny because I, I went through a spell where people were saying like, oh, Pope just copies and pastes, you know, and um, so I, I, I did start showing a little bit of what I do um, in the sense where yeah, the kind of screen grabs of, well, no, I'm actually, I'm having to make a model. <laughs> Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? I suppose it's a bit like magic, you know, like everyone wants to know how a magician does something, but when they do see it, actually they, they think they do, but I don't think they actually do. I don't think they can comprehend it either, really. Uh, you know, it's very uh, interesting that you said about uh, the half an hour thing. That to me is the most profound thing you said. And I wonder, can uh, I ask, can I make an assumption? You know, like if you were like a painter and you were just adding layers and layers and layers, uh, you'd mess up the painting very fast, right? But do you think the ability, do you think, the undo tool and the fact that you've got unlimited paint and resources because you're on Photoshop can be like detrimental. If you, if you had to five hours on something and you were sat there for five hours, do you think because of the fact that you can take things away and add them with the undo tool, the redo tool and all these things, it, it, it can kind of swamp down that you get a bit of like choice paralysis. Is that kind of it? Yeah. And, and I see a lot, a lot of this with, especially in my industry, you know, like the design and, and art side where, yeah. People, people think it's got to be a straight line. It's got to be a perfect square. It's got to be, you to, know, to and, the grid sort of thing. Yeah, and but and I used to do that many years ago, you know. But then I kind of trained myself to stop becoming um, a lot more where it's it, it's not actually a problem. It, mm. It's actually more nice just to be fluid with, about things than than it is to sort of make sure it's a perfect line and sometimes i'll deliberately make things like a bit wonky yeah because <laughs> so I'll, I'll give it i'll give another little secret away yeah just, uh -huh. just because i hope they're not secrets really but the the, the part of how my brain works because this is how i'm trained to think um is that it might inspire others to think like this as well is the fact that yeah. sometimes if you deliberately put in mistakes, so then people spot the mistakes and it, it kind of creates a bit of data drama on <laughs> online. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so you're messing with your algorithms on social media, you know? So sometimes I'll deliberately do something yeah. because it, it spikes the algorithm to then bring in a new sort of audience, let's say. <laughs> very good, yeah. It's very uh, interesting. I, I, yeah, because I, I played, I played, I, you know, my job in the past was to take data yeah. on a brand, let's say, when I used to work for Boss or Lacoste or something, and it could be their, you know, the their, their new fragrance, let's say, you know, and um, they would capture this data based on, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then it was my job to take that data in 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 and force it in a direction that would make people impulse buy, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my, my head still works in a in a design psychology way. So I'll do certain things to to designs to to trigger that to trigger the brain. That's, um, yeah, that's quite interesting, and um, I I was interested to see where you were going with that because um, I think to you know not to kind of segue too deeply, but uh, electronic music is something that's quite similar to digital art in the sense that uh, it's very grid based. Things are perfectly timed to music and things like that. And I think yeah. when you get to a certain level of making electronic music, one of the the weirdest things that you'll see is a lot of the really good producers purposely go in and take things out of time and add grit and and try make things sound more human so it's quite interesting yeah. that you mentioned this clinical it's just, um, you know it's, it's the same with with the design you know you, yeah yeah you, you can build a building that houses people but can you make this building look like something that's wow you know or yeah. is is that part of the brief to make it wow? Or is it the brief is just to hold people inside? You know, yeah. Uh, it's the same with anything. I think if you if you look, I mean, one of the one of the other 
I call them secrets, but they're not really, you know, but every single design that I do, it, it's got a piece of music trapped inside of it. Yeah. Like every single one has got its own either soundtrack or it's got its own single tune. Um, and it's that that creates the art, you see? So I use a lot of music to... to Inspire. To, so if I, and, and it could be random, you know, it, like one day I might be listening to I don't know, punk or something or rock. Yeah. Next day I might be listening to something softer, easy listening, classic type thing. Right. And, and, and it's that what draws the shapes, you see. It, it, it creates the mood or it creates the color tones or... And that's the other side of the problem with, with controller art is there's limitations on really like the components that you can get, uh -huh. you know, the colored buttons or the colored. So you're almost kind of fixed within a, um, a color palette, you know, yeah. unless you went totally custom and um, had, had things sprayed or, um, you, you know, anything's po people i used to get told that's impossible yeah um but it's it's only impossible because it hasn't been done yet okay yeah yeah so yeah. that that's how i think you see so it's you know like going to the moon was impossible but guess what someone actually did it yeah um you know so that's that's why i always tell people when they go oh it's, that's impossible well no it's not you just got to kind of start to think how how can you, how can you do it? You know, yeah, uh, yeah. Rather than just being lazy about it and go, ah, I can't do that. It's impossible. You no, know? it's 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 a great um, it's a great thing to think about. I guess the limitations uh, are there, but you know, a lot of the time they're just guidelines. I suppose is what you're saying, and uh, you can yeah. transcend that, right? Um, well, you're speaking of guidelines when you work with brands. Honestly, it's it's because you have your equity guidelines. You see that you you get you kind of get handed to you know and then they go what you want we want you to create something like crazy you know you kind of create something crazy and they kind of go we can't do that that's not part of the equity that's not part of the brand guidelines you know anything hang on a minute <laughs> it, yeah, yeah so what i always tell people from the start is literally i'm gonna break i'm gonna take your rules you got you got your, your brand guidelines and i'm gonna rip them up mm -hmm. because that that my job is to break rules because otherwise, how do you create something new? You know, it's uh, it, I'm sure it's something that when you do that, they're pretty receptive to as well in the end, right? I'm assuming it's oh, that, they, yeah. they're, they're gonna go, okay, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, and you're the expert, I suppose. So, I wanted to talk to you about these commissions specifically. I want to ask you which you feel you know, you're out of all the gaming companies you've worked with or which is the piece of art that as as its own piece of art like you're happiest with or actually you know what scratch that because you know you mm. might think that a piece that you've done is the best example of that game you know um concentrated in in, in the form of like a controller skin or anything what, what's the piece of work that you feel like you're the happiest with your favorite commission basically do you know i i, I do get asked that question a lot and and I still can't think of it because, mm. and, and it's true when I say I haven't I haven't created it yet, because the the problem I have is that they're all special in their own different ways, you know. Yeah. Um, like I did I did I did actually tweet a few a few weeks ago because I'm working with a game at the minute or a game developer, and I and I truly think I've actually made my best controller ever. Like right. control design. it's yet to be seen you know mm -hmm. um but this thing is like is crazy as hell you know like and it's because it fits with with you know the the whole sort of story about the game you know yeah. um, and i think that's allowed that like a different side to, to kind of come out you right. know um so uh, I think the one that is uh, what everyone's about to say is probably the, the nicest best, the best one yet. Yeah. So you'd uh, so you'd say that you you feel that you still haven't quite created your masterpiece. No, um, because yeah, it, it's 
it, and if you notice within you know my art i'll i'll try different forms you know i'll try different mm-hmm. ways of doing stuff and um and then i kind of because you know i, I kind of get bored easy yeah um so then i'll just switch it to a different style you know but um I, i'm quite privileged in that i've had i've got so many years experience i can change into different design modes just like within a within seconds you know yeah, yeah. um uh, but you know ideally what i would you know if you asked us what would be your goal in life uh-huh what would be would your goal be, in life <laughs> It's to take all that knowledge that I've got in my crazy little head, yeah, and give it all back. You know, it's to kind of, I don't know. I have something so is, is it is it teaching? Is it becoming a mentor? Is it becoming um, somewhere? Do I write a book? Because I've done a lot of things. You know, <laughs> I've uh, I've designed for the Queen. I've uh, what did you, you what did you design for the Queen? It wasn't a controller, I guess. <laughs> no, it was uh, so it was um it was it was kind of like an ornamental thing. Um, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, that would have been good. What what Xbox controller of yours do you think the Queen uh, would like the most? Uh yeah, it, it it does I think it still sits down in London actually in some some <laughs> residency place or something. Um uh, you know, I've done interiors for famous people. I've done oh, I've even worked with uh, Warren Buffett. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff Thanks. like that, you know. It's and and I'm still the same guy, you know. I think I remember this um, this this client once, and I'm like really like up there clients, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like one of those like bow down clients, you know. And I'm I'm just waffling away in my Geordie accent and, and having a laugh, and uh, I think that PA was like. Oh my god, what's he saying? What's he saying? <laughs> yeah, they're you know, like a translator uh, or something for the like high ups. Yeah, not because they were scared in case I was just like, you know, <laughs> you being too, too funny or something, you know. But um, no, I, I, I kind of don't change myself for anybody, you know, whether you, you know, you, whether you're big or small, you'll, you'll still get the same person, you know. Yeah. Um, that's it's the... it's because I'm not I'm not that way inclined, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I like to be more down to earth, um, and I kind of and I like to to kind of use that side that fun cheeky side that I am in in my social feed. So you know I tend to joke a lot, or and, and it always kind of shocks us as well when some people go, "Oh my God, Pope spoke to us." <laughs> like, like yeah, like why would I not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but like. Only got like eight followers or something, and I was like, "And like, it's just a number. It doesn't define you as a person. Like, you could be like a really super cool person, you know? Like, <laughs> like, like, yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah, eight can't... followers. Yeah, it's it, you know, it, it's a weird thing on Twitter, isn't it? But I think modern, modern. I'm not saying modern people, but I think a lot of people do look at that that side of social media. They're kind of like. They don't want to associate or mingle with people lower than themselves, you know. And, and it's like it's pretty sad, really, because who knows? Like this person who's yeah. only got eight followers. It's... The, the, way, the way I look at it, right? So this person who's got eight followers, right? Uh huh. Could who who's who you didn't know, but that dad was like some prime minister or president or something. Yeah. yeah. Who then? Could get you networked into somewhere else and somewhere else, and so, so you never you know, know you dear. Should... You never know. Yeah, yeah. So I always treat people as if like out of kindness because I'm a kind person. But the fact is, that you never know where I could lead you to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. You know, I think if you start closing doors off in your, especially in your career or or, or you know in gaming or or whatever. Um, you'll find it. It's going to be more difficult to kind of find your way if, if that's something you want to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm and I'm just seeing these as, as guidelines to, to how I got it really close to somewhat the round table, you know. I yeah, because I'm very tight with some of the executive executives, you know, and 
you know, I don't sort of hound them or anything. It, it's the fact I, I think they, they kind of like me because I, I can keep my distance if I need to or approach them if I need to. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I've worked hard to to achieve that trust, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I think a lot of people also, what I'll tell them is I've done some, some crazy, not, it's hard to say not nice, but un, not even unpleasant things, but some not cool things in life, you know? Yeah. Um, and I could have stuck with that side of how I wanted to be, you know? Yeah. But I didn't. I kind of I kicked myself up the butt and, and I changed, you know? Um, and, it, and it's not too late for people out there who probably think, oh, you know, I've, I've made a mistake. I've, I've, yeah. No one's going to like us anymore. No one's going to trust us anymore. Yeah. You know, you can't it can't change, you know. So don't let it kind of get you too down. But it's on you to make that change. And you probably have to work twice as hard, but um but you're it in is control possible. of of how you go forward, right? So exactly. There'll be lots of people listening who are just interested to learn more about you and and uh, to sort of show up to the clergy that is the Pope. But there might be some people out there who are listening and also might be really inspired by your work. So I think a good place to end this conversation yeah. would be for you to take the floor. And uh, if you've got any like bits of advice that you'd like to give to people who are maybe a little bit younger and kind of getting into the idea of art or want to do something similar, maybe not maybe controllers or, or fan art or even interior design, but, but art in general, what advice would you give to, to those? You know, I think, um, one, one, one of the things I, I used to always um, sort of be petrified or, or, or was was people copying what I did, you know? Yeah. Um, and I used to get I used to get a little bit upset by it, you know. And then I had a I had a grand master. I know it sounds a bit weird, but he was he was like a master of design, you know. And, yeah. And yeah. he took he took me under his wing and and kind of. It's almost, you know, like a like a karate kid. Scenario, yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that is actually true, you know. And if you look back at, at like history of art and design, there's a lot of people who uh, became grandmasters, you know, and they, they kind of took this person. Absolutely. Way, you know? Yeah, the best way, and, in my opinion. And, uh, yeah. And so obviously he says was they're not copying; they're just you've inspired them, mm-hmm. you know. So. One of the things I took away from that is always look for inspiration, you know. So if there's a designer that you kind of like, or if there's an artist that you kind of like, um, don't don't be scared to kind of copy their style mm-hmm. because you're not you're not actually copying. What you're doing is you're, is you're learning techniques, you're learning um, new ways of doing things, and you're probably not going to be as as fluid and, and and as as good as them, but that's that's not the goal. Mm. The goal is just to learn how to you know how to move the pen, how to how to think, um, and then what what you should start to do after that is you create your own style. So you just become your own artist, or you become. And and what will happen is when you get into the industry is you'll you'll keep get you'll keep the um. You know, people will keep knocking you down, mm. and you'll keep in your in in your head. You'll kind of think, "Oh, like I'm not good. Like I, I, I'm I'm really rubbish at this. Like like I'm not cool. Like I, I'm a rubbish designer. You know, mm. but you're not you're not really. It's just sometimes you've got to stand up a bit a bit taller, a bit stronger, and think, "Well, I'm right because of this, this, and this." Yeah. So if you've got, if you should always justify your work, you know, because then people will go away and go, oh, actually, now you say that, mm. that, that's a really cool idea, you know. Yeah. Uh, so never be scared to, to, to voice what you feel is is the right way to do it. You know, I get a lot of people criticizing some of the things that I do, and I could easily go back and go, well, no, no, you're not right because of this, this, and this. But now because i'm older and wiser i kind of go all right cool like thanks for the advice you know yeah but like i don't need to argue with them because like i'm not really that precious 
because I could just design something else tomorrow, you know, like, or I can just go away and have a sandwich and a cup of coffee and come back and like think of another idea. Like, mm -hmm. like, like that's the problem with, with when you become good at what you do. Um, you, you're not, you can't be dictated to because you just go, all right, cool. I'll just think of something else then. Like, like that's not a problem. I've I've had clients where I've had like I've worked months on a design like an interior, mm -hmm. and then like a, a new they they would like I don't know leave to go on maternity or something I don't know, and um, so a new a new person would come in and and just because they're trying to impress their boss they would change the design mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like you would have to go back to the drone board and kind of scrub everything you know and and like change things you know but. And, and and that's a kind of hard thing to take because when you're designing things, sometimes they become your little babies, you know, because you, 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 you've worked on them so long, yet they're like little precious stones, you know. And then, um, so when you have to kind of like undo everything and, and, and kind of go back, it, it, it can hurt a bit. But I, I think a piece of advice would be is, it wasn't wrong or it wasn't thing. You just learn something new, you know. You, you, you know. It, it's that whole. The more you draw, the 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 the, the better the curve, you know. Or right. The straighter the line, or the, you know, like no one is a natural at designing art. You have to be trained. It. You have to be trained. That you can't. It's not like music where you can naturally, you know, play something. Mm -hmm. Design's not a natural thing. It's it, you have to be trained, right, yeah. to become good. You know, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and, and 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 I know you guys uh -huh. are going to hate me for this, uh -huh. and, and and I said, but you you <laughs> you apparently are like this, uh -huh. yeah. But you know, but you know, I've kind of like joined the an NFT community, uh -huh. and, and, it, and it was kind of weird because, I, and obviously, it's been in the works for for a long time. You know, being partnered with GameStop and we're kind of doing this kind of NFT thing. You know, so I knew about it. Oh, God knows how many, <laughs> God knows how long ago. You know, uh -huh. and um, but it's just took so long to, to kind of get the wheels moving anyway. So that got announced the other day. And it's funny, you know, because obviously I know it's a it's a funny industry, NFTs. Like, what are they? Wait, what do they do? They even confuse me, and I do them, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's like, what, what, like, what? So I just do a piece of art, put it on here, and then like, I don't know, people bid for it or something. All right, cool, whatever. Um, so I, I, I'm sort of dabbling in that area, and it, and it's funny because the reaction is, congratulations, Paul, you know. And then the other side is like. We hate you, <laughs> you know, like we hate you. <laughs> that, yeah. So for the audio listeners there, Pope is brandishing the Wired Productions Fuck NFTs sticker. Uh, exactly. Not available anywhere because PAX stopped us giving them out. Um, because... uh, I, I always get all the exclusive stuff, me, man. So, yeah, yeah ex exactly. So you've got that. <laughs> you've got that. And uh, I should wear it on your T-shirt, shouldn't I? Just like as a point of irony, that's it. Well, yeah, enjoying the banter. I, I cannot, I cannot believe you've brought this up on the Wired podcast. That's so ballsy. Like, we're gonna, I'll, I'll leave it in, and everyone at Wired's gonna go. He, he did, he did the NFT thing. So yeah, uh, yeah because like, but you gotta remember, it's I don't intentionally like I'm not intentionally uh, naughty or trying to stir the pot. It, it's just I'm just naturally like this. I'm just a, a funny, wacky kind of fun loving guy if you know what i mean so I, I, everything i do it's it's never to to kind of hurt any feelings or, or whatnot you know it's just i'm just naturally like that so it's doing the nft even though it's like a balanced diet to me you see it's like book nfts but i do nfts you know it's like <laughs> you know, right it's like, perfectly balanced as all things should be so now I will it's the yin and yang. See, I've got yin and yang, yang, going on yang. Here. Very good. <laughs> well, uh, to keep things balanced, I will Thanos snap you out of existence and return back to Aaron for the rest of the podcast. Pope, thank you very much for sharing uh, your no expertise worries. there. And hopefully that inspired 
some people who it inspired me. I was listening to, and I don't even, I never wanted to draw a straight we'll line in my do, life. We'll have, we might have to do a, um, a second series, you know? We'll, like, we'll, we'll have you back. We'll have you back. Yeah. Um, we'll do it longer though, because I can't talk underwater. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll do it. We'll do a full length next time because this has nearly been an hour. See, so I'm going to cut Aaron's podcast time in half now. So, uh, bye, so Aaron. Wired unplugged. That was it's long. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. that was. Well, some time. I told you. Look, I'm, 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 I'm like, like uh, well, thank you to me and Pope Art there. Um, so yeah, that was good. A little bit of NFT banter at the end there, cheeky boy. Uh, he knows the wired stance, and he still did it. I love that he did it. He brought the stick up as well. He was, you, you, you know, he was doing the eight mile kind of thing. If I, if I kill myself, you can't kill me. He was showing it. Um, Reference. That, that, yeah, you know, do you know what I mean? He was, uh, yeah. So that was that was very funny. Um, and so yeah, like. Thank you to Pope. I actually thought the most interesting thing about all of this was how he was on about humanizing things by like, don't worry if the line you're drawing isn't the straightest or things like that and whatever. Yeah. So, um, I the, the one the one thing I I, I I I genuinely love about there's many things actually, but one I love the fact that yeah. he's always down to bring texture into his work and takes texture into consideration in terms of hey, if if I'm making this controller how to bring the texture of the video game world into the person's hand. It, it, so I, I love those considerations, but it also goes back to just how, you know, he is, he has worked with some major brands outside of gaming, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely next level. Yeah. Bizarre. The queen. The queen. The queen yeah. with Liz. Um, yeah. But, you know, and, and, and the gaming stuff is a relaxing hobby. And it's like, how, how nice is that? But it's it's still utmost excellence that he brings every single time. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, just it's, yeah, lovely, what a talent, lovely guy. And I'd like to mention a note from our sponsors. Uh, Mr. Z says <laughs> to let the people know, and I quote: <clears throat> "Wired are anti NFT, but we can still be friends. NFT pegged to cryptocurrencies are the devil's children." So there we go. I like that he said that. And I don't know if I don't know if Leo was being a bit poetic there. The devil's children and the Pope. It's getting all a bit biblical towards the end here. So listen, everybody at home, thank you very much for joining us. Hope we don't get raptured. Um but it feels like hell is on earth already because it's so hot. So if you're listening to this and, and you're in the UK and you don't know what aircon is, stay safe, drink some water and everything like that. We'll be back next week for more. Uh Aaron, it's so good to have you back. It's Good to see you again, mate. Woohoo! Thank you, guys. Goodbye. See you next time. Word Unplugged.